Happy birthday again. You got an opportunity this morning already to sing number 15. If you want to turn there again, I just want you to see the words. We won't sing it again, but it goes like this. Number 15 in your hymnals, if if they're available in front of you there. My maker and my king. I don't know about you, but when, when you sing something like that, my hope is that you're singing with understanding. My hope is that when you come to church, you, you don't just come here because the, the sound of the music is something that is good for your heart and, and, and maybe the recollection of good times with Jesus, but also the words. My maker and my king, to thee my all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. It's a, it's a statement of saying every good thing, every, every great blessing that I have ever had in my life comes from you, God. So I hope, I hope as you sang that, you were, you were thinking it as well. The, the sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. The creature of thy hand, okay, this is, this is now a statement that says, I believe that he is the creator and I am his creature. On thee alone I live. Again, uh, the, the, the power, the power of that statement. If you're ready to make that kind of statement, then you understand that that same God who created you is also given you a mission to go on to tell other people that there is a creator God, that he has created you, and that if others accept that, then they too can be part of his kingdom My God, the benefits demand. Thy benefits demand more praise than I can give. Have you ever thought about the benefits of of being a Christ follower, being a God follower? (coughs) My wife and I were going to visit uh, Joyce last night. Joyce lives, hi Joyce if you're watching. Uh, Joyce lives uh, up north of Lancaster now. So she's not able to come and join us very often. But on the way, we're in traffic, and um, the most crazy thing started happening in front of us. Now, we're not going fast. We're going slow in traffic. And the door on the car in front of us opens while the car is moving, and a leg comes out. And then it goes back in, and then it comes out again, and then two legs come out. And we're looking at this and we're saying, this is, this is a lady's legs, okay? Is she trying to get away? Has she been abducted? Is she just mad with the driver? But we could see that she was being pulled back in. So we're driving slowly. I'm, I'm not one of those people who runs away when things happen like this. I think about what you know, could happen and whether or not it might require some help. Fortunately, there were other people around who thought the same thing. What this lady wanted to do was to be separated (laughs) from the driver of this car. And we didn't know why, but someone else in in, in a little Hyundai, they drove in front of this car and stopped, effectively pinning the car between us. And the door came further open, and the lady got out. She grabbed her bag, and she stalked off. And she, of course, was swearing a blue streak at at whoever was still driving that car, which continued to follow her as she walked along the side of the road. Now, this is Highway 14 at rush hour on the way into Palmdale. Some of you are smiling like, yeah, I've seen that before. And if, you are see, if, if you're smiling and, and you see, you're, you're saying that you're used to the crazy that's going on. Because there are just so many, many people. This is how Chris and I say it. We, we say the, the crazy's got them. Whatever it is, 
that, that, that is part of their circumstances due to the choices that they have made, maybe the upbringing that they have had, the crazy has got them. Now, the fact that she had chosen uh, uh, many times to go to the tattoo parlor, uh, you know, it may have influenced my thoughts about the, the choices that she's made in her life. Now, I wasn't thinking, because I don't know, as to whether or not she's good, bad, whatever. But she wanted out of that car. And I was wondering whether or not you know, there would be any other sort of violence right there on Highway 14. I get further into Lancaster, I do see a, a, a cop car with his lights on, speeding the other direction. And I just, again, we, we prayed a second time, because Chris and I pray when we see an ambulance, when we see a, a police car, Amen. we pray not only for the first responders, but we pray for the people that they are going to help. So we don't know. We may never know what happened. But it certainly looked like the crazy had the, the upper hand. So when you sing things like, my maker and my king, to thee my all I owe, I hope I hope you are realizing that you're making a promise to God and you're thanking him that the crazy hasn't got you. My God, the bene thy, thy benefits, thy, the benefits of being a Christian, the benefits of being a God follower are more, th those benefits demand more praise than I am able to give. Have you ever, have you ever felt like, you know, that, that $80, that $120 uh, 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 bouquet of flowers? It's just not enough. And you're thinking, I could spend $500 and it still wouldn't be enough to tell this person how much I love them. I mean, isn't that why guys save up their life savings to buy a diamond for their... Because it's a statement of love. Uh, it, you know, this is, this is why the diamond industry is doing so well. I told my daughter, don't get a diamond. There's too many of them in the world. We call them precious stones. Well, they're precious because the diamond industry told us they were precious. There's actually less rubies in the world and sapphires. There's actually less. Don't, don't tell them I told you though, okay? All right. So she, she had her husband get her a garnet, actually. Her wedding band has a beautiful red garnet in it, and my darling, I love you. They're watching from Canada. Actually, maybe not today. They're in Sandpoint, Idaho, at a wedding, another wedding. They're this age. You guys on the back row, you are that age where you're going to be asked to go to weddings all the time. I think my daughter and my son-in-law are going to seven different weddings this year. They're asking, how, how much do we have to pay for gifts? <laughs> I said, dude, that is, that is totally up to you, but, um, you know, get them something interesting for 50 bucks. Okay. The word today is Separation. Separation. Separation from the, 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 the spiritual, you could say, from the carnal. Separation in the second day of creation, the waters above and the waters below. We see in this account in Genesis, because there's Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we see that God is in the midst of creating the world. Uh, those of you who may struggle with the whole evolutionary thing, just understand this. My father-in-law, when he contemplated this as a paleontologist, as a uh, marine biologist, as somebody who was looking at the age of the earth, etc., etc., he was able to say... Maybe there was something there. So don't get all upset if people say, oh, the earth is millions and millions of years old. We did a core sample. Yeah, maybe it is. 
Maybe there's matter that is part of this world because God says that the Spirit of God, as Eric and I were looking at this text this week, the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. And then he switches on the lights. That was last week. And we, we saw how uh, the creation of light is also like when God sends his son into the world. And as I was explaining to Jace just now in the children's story, when Jace asked me, why do we have a candle up here? I said, this is the light of the world. This is Jesus. He's the flashlight for our lives. Okay? And, and so G, he switches on the lights and the next thing that he does is he separates the waters. There are waters above and there are waters below. And in between, big words like firmament or small words like sky. I prefer sky. We look up into the heavens, into our atmosphere, and what do we see? We see the sky. And, and guess what? The sky brings us so much joy, so much uh, interest. We, we look at the sky and we, we wonder what's going to happen next. Okay, finish the sentence for me. Red sky in the morning is a? Sailor's warning, shepherd's warning. Red sky at night is a? Sailor's delight, shepherd's delight. People who spend time outside, they look at the sky and they look at the sky to tell them what's coming. Now with these scattered showers that we've been having in Santa Clarita, you can be in New Hall and it's sunshine and you can look over at Saugus and it's dark clouds and it's raining. You look at the sky and you get to figure out what's coming next. The expanse that is in between, God calls it sky. You can also think of the fact that, that at this moment, he is introducing to this planet that he is making the vast difference, the separation, if you like, between God and his creation. Didn't we just sing, my creator, I am the creature of your hand, okay? If you accept that, which I do, then you're saying a, a, a big, huge mouthful that a lot of other people in North America today uh, do not accept. I don't know if you are aware of this, but uh, in, in one of his last encyclical letters, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, then Pope, said, it's okay to be an evolutionist and be a Catholic. It's all right. You can be both. And as stunning as, as that may be to you, you have to do the thinking about where that would come from. Where that sort of a claim would come from. And basically what it says is, we know best... We're not allowing God to be this big creator God. We're not allowing him to make that separation between him and us. The Bible tells us that his ways are higher. His thoughts are beyond our thoughts. Right from the very get-go, day two, it is very evident in God's creation that there is a separation. And so we are introduced in many respects to another big word which many people are scared of. So here's what to be scared of. Blasphemy. Whew. Pastor's talking about blasphemy. Here's the blasphemy. I will be as God. So if you learn one thing today from the second day of creation, realize that if you don't believe there's any separation between you and God, if you have drunk the Kool-Aid that was given to Adam and Eve first, that you believe that you are your own God, then you are in a state of blasphemy. 
against the God who created this world and who by the Genesis account separated the waters above from the waters below. The waters above, you could say, were fresh water. The waters below, as we know today on the face of the earth, are salt water. This is something that has been part of humanity for many, many millennia. What happened at the Tower of Babel? You had a group of people at that time, the group of people on the face of the earth, saying, we don't believe God. There's a rainbow in the sky. We don't believe his promise. So we're going to build a tower up to heaven so we can be higher than him. And God uses a very ingenious method of dispersing the crowd. Tu parles français? A qui arabe? I know some of you speak Spanish, so I won't ask that one. It's not as much fun. I know some speak Russian. He changed the languages. And suddenly, people grouped themselves together in different language groups and moved off. And guess what? We're still doing that today. In this town, there is a church where you can go to church in Spanish if you so need to. There's a big hole in my heart, though, that sometimes I see that language still separates us. I don't think that, that it is as useful maybe as it was in the past. And there's a, a great desire in my heart for us as, a, as an Advent people to present a united front. And yet language gets in the way and culture gets in the way. It separates us. Well, that all happened at Babel when the human race decided not to trust God, decided to say, we will be higher than God. So non-acceptance of God as he has presented himself here in creation, well, we know that as blasphemy. And that leads to separation, which is my simple definition of sin. What is sin? Well, it's not sins. Sin is separation, deliberate separation from God, going our own way. So what does the prophet Isaiah say? All we like? Sheep. <laughs> Do you see why? I'm not so sure I want to be a sheep, you know, even though the kids sing that song. I just want to be a sheep. Bam. Okay, we say we want to be a sheep in his pasture, that he is our good shepherd. Yes, I understand that. But sheep are dumb. Are we that dumb? Are we that interested in going our own way? I'd like to think we're not. But hey, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Yes, it is the oldest book in the Bible, Genesis was written by Moses, but first he wrote Job. Job is, is a play. Job is a, a situational comedy in some respects. It has characters in it like Job and his wife and, and his three friends. Read it this afternoon if you're not able to take a nap. I know you'll read it after your nap. Okay, so Job, Job is this poetic book that starts out in a very interesting way. Satan has come to heaven after he was thrown out. And he is walking with the other leaders, known in the Bible as princes, of other planets of other dominions, wherever that is and whatever that is. And God comes up to him and says, and where do you come from? 
And why would you think God would ask a question like that, uh, a question he obviously knew the answer to? Basically, he was carding, he was carding Lucifer. Where's your credentials? Show me your credentials, please. What right do you have to be here? This is a by invitation only event. And so what does Lucifer say? I come from walking up and down on the earth. It's my dominion. It's my place. I won it fair and square when Adam handed me the keys. So what does God say? Hey, Lucifer, you know you're not welcome here. There's the door. Don't let it hit you in the backside on the way out. Is that what he says? No. He doesn't say anything except <laughs> he, he does something which, <laughs> Lord knows, maybe he's done to you and maybe he's done to me. Because we're all say, sitting here today saying that we're ready to be witnesses for God. Yes? He points down to the earth and he says, Yo, Lucifer, have you seen my servant Job? Oh, no. Job's going to be in the spotlight. Job doesn't know it, but he is about to be a witness for the kingdom of God. Uh, Lucifer, I don't know, have you ever thought that God can be somewhat sarcastic? And Actually, I think he can. We're going to read something in a moment that, that will show you that. Uh, have, you, have you seen my servant Job? He lives in your kingdom. He lives in your dominion. But he worships me. He's, he's made a separation. He's made a separation between your kingdom and who he serves. He does not serve you, Lucifer. He serves me. Oh, yeah, God, that's right, he does. Uh, I've, I've been seeing him, but, but you know, that's because you've put a hedge of protection. You've got a fence around him that means that I cannot do anything to him. I bet if I could, he would curse your name. I don't know about you, but have you ever wondered whether or not God has ever had a conversation with the devil like that about you? And the devil has actually asked to tempt you, has asked to do something to you that God has allowed? Sometimes, Eric, I, Mom uh, Thornburg, uh, Dad Thornburg, I, I wonder that about Pete. Is, is this the way that God has decided to deploy his life? You know, uh, so when we pray, I'm, I'm praying a very, I'm trying to be a very faithful follower of God, and I'm praying, God, it, it, this, this is very interesting what you're doing here, because Pete looks an awful lot like Job right now, and, and, and we, we don't know if that's the case, but he looks an awful lot like Job, and, and as, as he is having, having this, this thing done to him in this life, I, I, I don't know, God's up there, and he's He's saying, have you seen my servant, Pete? So that's why I'm asking all of you, have you ever wondered whether God has said that about you? And how would you feel if he, he had? In, in that situation, God is seen allowing the devil to get worse and worse with Job until finally all Job has left is his life. He's in agony. He's in the ash heap. And he has friends who think they're helping. Who really are not. Finally, God in this poetic book of Job says this. He calls to Job out of the storm. Now did I say that we're seeing 
more of the crazy stuff than ever before in this world. So out of that craziness, you could say, God speaks. And he says to Job, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and you shall answer me. I, I would imagine Job is quaking in his boots at this point. I know I would be. And then he asks this question, which begins an entire uh, huge tirade, if you like, from God. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? In other words, on day two of creation, when I separated the water above and the, from the water below, when I called it sky, where were you? You think you know? You think you understand? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Did I not tell you that God has a little sarcastic streak sometimes? Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid the cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together. That's coming up later in our series. And all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors? When it burst forth from the womb. When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said... This far you may come and no further. Have you been to the ocean recently? Are you really, really glad like I am that we are not having a tsunami every day? When that wave breaks and those surfers enjoy the ride, they know that that ride is coming to an end in about 150 yards because that's when the surf is going to come up on the beach and it's going to go back. Who decided that it should act? That the huge, powerful oceans should be contained by the beach? Have you ever given orders to the morning? I love this part. Or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges? Take the earth by its collar, okay? <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful imagery that the dawn, the dawn takes the earth by its edges and shakes the wicked out of it? Here's a play again on the light and the darkness. And the dawn comes every morning and shakes the darkness out of the earth. Isn't that amazing? That's big. That's huge. That's, that's way beyond anything that I can comprehend. So finally, you must go to the very end. 41, 40, 41, 42. Chapter 42. This this. Sent this, this whole speech by God goes on for a very long time. Very well worth reading. Then Job replied to the Lord. We say we should, pray to, we should pray to God, but after you read something like this, shouldn't we be saying you should spend as much or much more time listening to God? Because this is all Job can stutter out. I know that you can do all things. Are you praying that for Pete? Are you praying that for that other crazy situation in your life? I know, God, that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Nothing is going to stop you, God, from doing whatever you want. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely, 
You ready? Because these are words I think that I should utter, and, and I'm, I'm putting it to you that I think you may want to utter. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. This, uh, things, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer. And Job says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Is it, is it your desire today not only to listen, but also someday to see Jesus? To see God face to face. Job says, I heard, I've heard about you. I've heard about you a lot. In fact, my friends were telling me what they thought about you, but that wasn't right. That, 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 I didn't believe that. But I, I now see you because I see your creation. I see you in your creation. Therefore, he says, here's how he feels about himself in this situation where God has just opened up all the cannons on him. Therefore, I despise myself. I am not anything. I am nothing. David talks about being a worm. This is the result of realizing the separation. This is the result of realizing that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He has bridged that gap with Jesus. Amen. When Philip says, show us the Father, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Praise God for his willingness to incarnate into us and bridge that gap of separation with a human called Jesus. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Oh, my friends, uh, as we journey together this year, our theme is turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things and the thoughts and the understandings and the I think this is the way it is kind of statements or even the limited knowledge that we have accrued over several thousand years of existence on this earth. The things of earth will grow strangely dim as he enlightens our path and helps us to understand more and more of who he is and the fact that he made us in his image and that he wants us to come home and be with him so that where he is, that's where we'll be too. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's like super good news. Uh, and, and, and when I encounter, if I ever get a chance to encounter that lady that, that wanted to jump out of that car in front of me on Highway 14, if I ever get a chance to talk to somebody like that, I'll tell you that I'm going to tell her about the one who came from up there all the way down here. Because of the chaos down here, he wants to bring peace. He wants to weld us back together with our true selves, with who it is that he designed us to be and loves us even though we're in the ashes. We're realizing just how silly it is that we think we know. Friends, uh, take what you do know, and it's a lot. Take what the Bible tells you, and it's a lot, and share it with somebody this week. Amen? Amen.